floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chairman Sullivan, and, and welcome home. Thank you. I, <clears throat> as uh, previously stated, my name's Click Bishop, currently serving as Alaska State Senator representing West Fairbanks in a broad sweep of rural Alaska, including 63 small villages situated in the Yukon, Kaiakuk, Tanana, and Copper River Valleys. As former Labor uh, Commissioner, I'm intimately familiar with the impacts of government decisions on our economy and on our working families through delay or outright denial of resource development projects. My previous career was a heavy equipment operator working on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and many other associated construction projects throughout Alaska. In my younger life, I spent over 18 years racing Yukon 800 style outboard river boats on Alaska's interior rivers, the Tanana and the Yukon. So it's safe to say that everything I've been involved in was since I've got out of high school and quite a bit what I did before has taken place on or near waters of the United States, especially under these new definitions. In speaking with you today, it's not my intention to regurgitate a long list of facts and counter arguments showing how and where federal agencies have overstepped their boundaries in this action. Those have been entered into the record hundreds of times after the proposed rule was published in the federal record over a year ago. Instead, I want to sound a warning that there will be a huge negative impact on the nation and Alaska's economy if the EPA and the Corps adopt these definitional changes, which it appears they are proceeding to do. I fear the impacts of the EPA's new enhanced and onerous powers generated by these proposed changes, impacts on small, family-owned and operated businesses, as well as large projects proposed in Alaska. It's interesting to note that whenever a government agency like the EPA or the Corps of Engineers seeks to clarify the meaning or a definition of a term or a phrase, it very seldom narrows its definition but rather broadens it to areas never envisioned by those who passed the Clean Water Act in 1972. Wouldn't it be more honest to look at the programs enabling legislation and keep any clarifications as true to the original intent of what Congress passed? As so often happens, we also see that the words of agencies are proposing to use to clarify and better define their regulations only further muddy the waters. How will they determine what is a significant connection to downstream water quality? What is a significant nexus? I, I note also that agencies are headlong rushed to impose this rule, ignoring the public process. In the case of their connectivity report, getting the decision done before the so-called science upon which the decision is supposed to be made is available. While stakeholders from state agencies to local governments express their concerns about this cart before the horse process, the EPA and the Corps move forward regardless. The agencies have moved forward their proposed changes without consultation with state and local agencies that will be required to implement and enforce the changes. In addition, they have moved forward with no regard or meaningful analysis of the fiscal impact to state and local agencies. It's clear to me the EPA, in lockstep with the Corps, view it as their mission to control every human activity within the water column, from the moment the raindrop hits the earth until it diffuses into the ocean. We in Alaska, we take great pride in our state superlatives which sets us apart from our sister states. Little things like our millions of acres of wetlands, millions of lakes, 30,000 miles of shoreline. We know it's cold and dark here and there's midnight sun in the summer. I see no evidence that the agencies will accommodate our unique features such as permafrost, a pervasive feature found in 63% of the state, yet unacknowledged in the new proposed regulatory scheme. Permafrost is an inhibitor of water flow. It's a sink for the storage of water. It should be specifically excluded from these regulations. Again, we are not sure how the agencies will determine what is a significant nexus. 
or that there is simply no nexus between cryogenically isolated permafrost and waters of the United States. Unique as we may be in Alaska, in regard to this new definition of waters of the United States, we are truly in the same boat as all our sister states and territories. With this definition change, we will see projects shut down in Anchorage, Sheridan, Wyoming, Seattle, Washington, and Topeka, Kansas. <clears throat> With that being said, I'd just like to wrap up in, in summary. This whole wetlands adjacent to adjacent regulation is the EPA's attempt to circumvent the Supreme Court. I don't know if the EPA knows this or not, but the Supreme Court is the highest law in the land. They get the last word and they have spoken. Implementing this adjacent regulation would overturn the Great Northwest decision and that has terrible implications for Alaskans all over the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bishop, for that very powerful testimony. I look forward to digging a little deeper with some of the questions. Um, uh, I'll just make it easy so they, they'll be really addressed to both of you, so either of you can um, respond or uh, build on the other's answers. Let me first by just uh, asking, given that you uh, represent very large parts of the state of Alaska, as you mentioned, Mayor Brower, and I'm sure it's the same with Senator Bishop, you're the, the geographic scope of the responsibilities that you cover is larger, both of you, than many states in the lower 48. Um, can you just briefly describe, to the extent your constituents are aware of this rule, and one of the, you know, one of the problems with a rule like this is that oftentimes our constituents are not aware, and then all of a sudden it becomes a final rule, and um, they're surprised. But to the extent your constituents are aware, what has been uh, their reaction? Chairman Sullivan. Yes. I'll I'll take the first stab at that. It's. It's, uh, I would note, you know, is even as late as last night at 930 a, 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 after I got done here in the building, I'm still fielding phone calls from concerned uh, citizens, business owners, and as early as uh, 630 this morning, I'm on my phone again. Uh, I've been contacted, you know, by all forms, uh, emails, phones, faxes, et cetera, et cetera, postings on Facebook. Uh, they're all united in their opposition to this rule, which, you know, if you look up the definition of federal overreach in the dictionary, you'll find a picture of the EPA extra, <coughs> and, and the original division of, uh, definition of navigable waters to eventually include every drop of water. They are not happy. Uh, the issue of federalism, you know, there's been a lot of concerns that this rulemaking process was very rushed, and indeed it was very rushed. And um, there is an executive order. It's an executive order number 13132. It's called the Federalism Executive Order. And it states, quote, when undertaking to formulate and implement policies that have, that have federalism implications, agencies agency shall, in determining whether to establish uniform national standards, they shall consult with appropriate state and local officials as to the need for national standards and any alternatives that would limit the scope of national standards or otherwise preserve state prerogatives and authority. Um, Madam Mayor, that, that the federalism executive order is in addition to the trust responsibilities the federal government has with regard to consulting the report that the EPA was using to base uh, as a basis of the science to move forward with the rule. However, the rule was promulgated well before the connectivity report was ever made public, which, as you can see, uh, as you mentioned, is a bit of the cart before the horse. Can you talk about a little bit more about that issue? I think uh, most people are unaware of that, and it does show the rush process yes briefly I just uh, you know in reviewing the three Supreme Court decisions as it relates to the top to your to your question at hand 
I just, I just find it. I just, I'm flabbergasted at, at the EPA, you know, at, at on these three Supreme Court decisions on on the connectivity piece. The Supreme Court has spoken very clearly on this, but yet the EPA just doesn't get it, and they and they're trying to circumvent the Supreme Court, and and I just, I just find it, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I just can't believe that the, they can't. Can't, you've got three Supreme Court decisions, it's written in plain English, even I understand it, but yet the EPA doesn't understand it, and they still want to try to connect these waters. Let me ask you a related question with regard to uh, a simple uh, but critical issue uh, that I'm sure I'm going to dig into with regard to the next panel as well. Um, do you see this... Uh, Mayor Brower and Senator Bishop, do you see this as an expansion of the EPA's jurisdiction over waters in Alaska, as the rule is currently written? So, yeah, Senator uh, Chairman Solomon, th this is definitely, definitely a a a a, a grab on to include all waters, everything they can get their hands on. So you would see this as an absolutely uh, absolutely you know and, and uh, furthermore I just you know what what really floors me about this whole process is they have not done a cost-benefit analysis on what the impact it is to the United States economy or the Alaskan economy Matt, uh, Senator Bishop you raised and I would like again both of our distinguished uh, witnesses to address this the EPA has stated in their uh, cost benefit that there would not be there would not be significant costs with regard to implementing this rule. Um, do you, uh, Senator Bishop, do you agree with that? Do you agree with there would be no significant costs, and, and in particular with regard to the interior? What do you think the impact would be on the small plaster miners that are still trying to? Eat out a living in this part of the state. Oh, the, you know, the, and that's a good question. You know, because they haven't done a cost-benefit analysis. It, it, it would, I would, I would uh, say it would be in the in the millions of dollars, and, and put, you know, it has the potential to put three hundred and sixty to four hundred and sixty small placer miners out of business. But bigger than that, we're trying to monetize Alaska's North Slope gas with the AKLNG project. And, and to date, just the impacts of the uh, of of the of, of the uh, wetlands mitigation disturbance just on the route that's been identified to date's already added a quarter of a billion dollars to the project that's already you know ne needs to be looking at every nook, cranny, and corner to save a nickel. And proposing this rule, who knows what a add to the cost of that pipeline and that's Alaska's economic future for the next hundred years. With actual knowledge <coughs> of wetlands, of the waters, of Alaska, in your communities, in the unique hydrology and geographic features that we have here, before promulgating a rule that is the classic Washington DC one size fits all approach to clean water. We all want clean water. As I mentioned at the outset, Alaskans do a much better job than the EPA in Washington on keeping our waters clean. Do you think that this rule would have benefited from the impact and input of constituents from your Senate district, Senator Bishop, or you, or Madam Mayor, constituents from the North Slope Borough, or you and your staff? Chairman Sullivan, it would have behooved the department greatly to take into serious consideration with boots on the ground. I mean boots on the ground, not boots in Washington, D.C., but boots on the ground walking from maybe Cactovic to Barrow looking at what permafrost looks like or walking from the Charlie River to Fort Yukon looking what the ground looks like. And and I mean, I'm serious. It This is, I, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted, you know. Again, you, you said it very eloquently. It's it's done in Washington, D.C. It's done in a vacuum. The people, if, if I would have proposed a regulation like this at the Department of Labor without giving the people of Alaska their full and just due on a proper hearing and proper notification, 
I would have been strung up by my bootstraps. And the last thing I'd like to say in closing is <clears throat> you, you might want to have your staff reference this and send a copy to the EPA. In, in President Obama's State of the State speech four years ago on page two or page three, he says, where my agencies are overreaching and stifling business in the United States, I'm going to work to lessen that impact. They need to go read the president's own memo from his State of the State speech. Thank you, Senator Bishop. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, has, would the EPA have been a panel? J Ms. Uh, Chairman Sullivan, thank you so much for coming home, holding this hearing in Fairbanks and throughout Alaska. It's uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, don't give up the fight. Keep fighting the fight. And uh, we're behind you 110%.